Hello, and welcome to our podcast for the Dark Corner Shard. Hello, hello. I am Vina, and I am your Dark Travels hostess. And today, I am joined by Serial Killers of Sierra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute, It I has think. been a minute. I feel like October? Uh, yeah. I think so. Something like that. Okay. Something All close right. to it, anyway. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So last week's episode was regarding Pearl Harbor and some of the mysteries surrounding World War Two. Yeah. But Pearl Harbor is in Hawaii. Correct. Which became one of our later states. Mm-hmm. It was a territory when the Japanese bombed yeah. us, Pearl Harbor, and Oahu, Hawaii. So we're going to close out our trip if you will, to Hawaii with... A Eugene Barrett. Okay. A serial killer? Because it's... Well, I mean... Yeah. He killed like three people. Okay. So I guess you can consider that. All right. So Eugene. Yes. Mr. Eugene. He was born Eugene Walter Barrett on June 30th, 1931 in Oakland, California. He was the older of two sons born to a Howard and Emily Barrett. Very little is known about his childhood, other than the fact that he studied at the Washington Intermediate School in Honolulu until he dropped out in the ninth grade. Dropped out? Uh, Yeah, I didn't know you were legally allowed to drop out in ninth grade. Is that an option? (laughs) Shit, I would have. (laughs) Right. He later joined the Army and fought in the Korean War, but he was dishonorably discharged in 1955 due to his excessive drinking. Oh. What was he drinking about? Oh, just everything. This dude's an out ripping alcoholic. Okay. All right. At some point after his discharge, I couldn't really find an exact date, he permanently moved to Honolulu where he began a romantic relationship with a woman named Annie E. Phillips, a divorced mother of five. Barrett was a house painter by profession, but he was unemployed and drank excessively, eventually leading to Phillips severing ties with him in 1959. Smart move. Ex- well, mm, mistake on her part. Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Unable to handle her rejection, the enraged Barrett decided that he would kill his ex-girlfriend. Oh, damn. Dude can't handle no, apparently. N- right. He armed himself with a gun, got on a bus to her apartment complex in Mayor Wright Homes, and forced his way inside. He walked across the living room where two of Philip's children were watching TV. But I guess the kids were kind of, you know, used Involved. to him. Well, they were used to him because right. his mom dated him for a while. Went into the bedroom where he found Phillips tending to her youngest child. Before she had time to react, Barrett pulled out his gun and shot her multiple times, killing her on the spot. Oh, in front of her children. In front of her children. The what ensuing a fucker. What an ass, right? Why? Uh, right. Why? The ensuing racket alerted the neighbors who managed to hold him down and beat him until the police arrived. Oh, good neighbors. What a good neighbors. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like a good neighbor, beat his ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at his trial, Barrett claimed that he could not recall the shooting as he was drunk at the time. However, that was contradicted by witnesses who claimed that he had said she deserved it. Oh. Mm-hmm. Vindictive okay. little asshole. Due to the overwhelming evidence against him, Barrett was found guilty, convicted, and sentenced to life imprisonment. It was later reduced to 15 to 50 years. I don't know why. And then in 1967, he was paroled. Oh. After the then governor, John A. Burns, commuted his minimum imprisonment term to eight years for unknown reasons. Okay. Thanks for that. Right? I'm like, this dude kills this woman in a rage in front of her children, and you reduce his minimum sentence to eight years. And tries to lie about it. Right? Like a fucktard. Aye, aye. 
He then returned to Honolulu, where he then married a Roberta Ulali Alviro in February of 1971. Their marriage was very short-lived, however, as she filed for divorce in November of 1972, citing her husband's excessive drinking as the primary factor. So, just out of curiosity, did he have violent tendencies prior or during the excessive drinking? Nope, just drinking. And he did show signs of, like, emotional unstability, but nothing violent other than... Obviously. Right. His shooting the ex-girlfriend. Right. A month later, on December 27th, he went to the Hawaii hotel where his ex-wife was staying at the time and stabbed her multiple times with a kitchen knife. Oh, did someone call the governor on that bullshit? Mm-hmm. Right. So he was arrested again, and after that, he waived his right to a trial and pled guilty to a reduced charge of manslaughter. Oh, how convenient. Yeah, I don't think if you've been charged for murder once, you should be able to do a plea deal. After you kill a second time. Yeah. He was sentenced to 10 years and then paroled in 1976, and then his parole requirements were dismissed in 1982. Jesus Christ. Talk about the system failing the next victim. Ridiculously. So for the remainder of uh, the 1980s, Barrett uh, resided in an apartment complex in Kayoon Street in relative peace but continued to drink and exhibit unstable emotional behavior. Well, where the hell was he getting his money if he was like, unemployed i could not find anything i don't understand it's kind of so no criminal activity no theft no stealing from the neighbors yeah and i would say he would probably get money from the from being in the army but he was dishonorably discharged and i don't think they give you money after that no yeah Mm. um across from him was 41 year old donisha roxanne kastner who had a checkered history of both substance and sexual abuse Despite this, she was allowed to look after her seven-year-old son, Ethan, whom she often took kayaking. While there was no confirmed intimate relationship between the pair, Barrett privately accused Kastner of mocking him by dating other men and supposedly indecently exposing herself to him. So they're not involved, but he thinks she's teasing him. Because she's dating other men and supposedly exposing herself. Because that's a thing. Does she have a history of it? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't expose myself to people. Me either. It's kind of a thing, guys. Right. I don't even like exposing myself to me. <laughs> I don't like looking <laughs> in a mirror. <laughs> Let alone somebody else. <laughs> the neighbor across the way. <laughs> okay. Friends and acquaintances even claimed that he would sometimes call them on the phone, hysterically claiming that he was afraid he was going to harm her. Jesus Christ. And nobody said anything to the cops? No. Because, I mean, it's not like he doesn't have a past. Oh, wait, he does. Uh, Not like, you know, he's prone to this. Of course not. Jesus Christ. After one such bout, he voluntarily asked to be admitted for psychiatric treatment at the Queens Medical Center, where he remained until early August of 1995. Okay, well, at least he's pursuing some sort of better avenue. Attempting, anyway. By the time of his release, Kastner had moved to a neighboring apartment across the street, which had angered Barrett, who believed that she would move away from the neighborhood altogether, which she should have. You know, it's just unfortunate. I mean, she's just doing her life. Yep, just out there living her life, and this weird, crazy-ass man has just got this this target on her. Yeah. That, you know... I don't know if she's aware. What, did she have any indication prior that he had this obsession with her? Not from what I could find. Okay. August 11th, 1995, just a few days after his release, Barrett spent most of the day drinking beer with his brother and a friend. After he went to get more beer at a local store, he saw Kastner entering her apartment. On a whim, he went back to his own apartment, got a twenty five caliber semi-automatic pistol, and went across the street. Wait, how does he have a fucking gun? Because he stole it. Oh. <sighs> So he went across the street and went right by Kastner's son, who was playing in front of the building. He then went inside Kastner's apartment and went into her bedroom. When she turned to face him, he shot her twice in the head and then left. Just like that? Yep. What a fucking monster. Just casual. Just pop, pop, gone. He was seen leaving by Kastner's son, who immediately called his father, who in turn called the police. Kastner was driven to the Queens Medical Center, but succumbed to her injuries later that same day. He just, <laughs> just speechless. Well, okay. He was in the the facility for how long? Mm, what? 
I didn't see exactly when he went in, but I would assume it was probably a couple of months and then just days later went and shot this lady. Now, do we? I know sometimes if you go in on your own accord, mm-hmm. you have the right to leave, leave on your own accord. Mm-hmm. Was that his scenario? Yeah, because he voluntarily went. Okay, do we know what he was diagnosed with? No. Okay, so then we probably don't know if he was given any medication Mm-mm. to kind of... Yeah, I couldn't find any, like, not even, like, after he was arrested, they didn't... What the fuck is the history of this guy that thinks he can just kill women? Was his dad abusive? I couldn't find nothing. There really? was nothing, like, there was very little about his childhood that I could find. And But he was from Oakland. Yes, originally. At a time where I think Oakland might have been... I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know the history of Oakland. I just know that. Mm. That can be a little rough. Yeah. Unless, unless you was a Raider fan. Right. Then you're pretty safe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I would be safe. Not that I'm personally advocating for that. <laughs> being born across the bay. Well, fair. But either way, okay. <laughs> Police examined the crime scene and located the supposed murder weapon, which was reported as stolen back in 1989, dumped near the apartment complex. However, 89? A- yeah, so he stole the gun in 89 and then shot and killed this girl in 95. He waited six years. Yeah. Six years with that gun. Yep. And thanks to the fact that he didn't have any parole officers checking in on him. Because his parole requirements were over with. Over with or null and void? They were uh, over with. He was. They were dismissed in 1982. Dismissed. Dismissed. In 82, okay, so we're talking 13 years later, okay. All yeah. Right. They don't typically keep you the parole that long. Well, obviously, this dude should have been. Okay, so he stole it from? From somebody. I from... couldn't find out where he stole it from. Okay. There was no sign of him. The following day, however, Barrett entered the Columbia Inn and pleaded with the manager to call police so he could surrender peacefully. The manager complied, and shortly afterwards, Barrett was arrested. He was hailed on a $120,000 bail and charged with murder, theft, and unlawful possession of a firearm to which he pleaded not guilty. So all of a sudden he's cooperating? Yeah. So he turns himself in and then pleads not guilty. <laughs> Logic. I just... Right, exactly. <laughs> Let me turn myself I in, but her, I didn't do it. but I didn't do it. I killed her, but I didn't. And here's how I did it. But I didn't do it. But I didn't do it. Okay. Like there was like witnesses. It's like OJ, pre-OJ years here. If the glove don't fit, it must have quit. Or <laughs> if, what did he say? I didn't do it, but if I had. But I mean, if I did. Yeah. This is how I would have done it. But, Jesus so that, Christ. That kind of shit always drives me nuts. I didn't do it, but if I did, this is the exact method I'd do it. But I want you to arrest me on this. Yeah. Right. Okay. Barrett's third murder charge sparked controversy, leading to the chief of the Hawaii Paroling Authority to release a statement claiming that a repeat offender with the accused man's record would never be paroled with contemporary laws. You know, two charges later. Right, because the first two didn't do him in. And thanks to the governor. Yay. Okay. Yeah. At the preliminary hearings, Castor's son, Ethan, was called in to testify against Barrett, making him one of the youngest witnesses to take the stand in the state's history. That poor boy. I know. I can't imagine. You have to go to a trial and testify. And your mother's murder. Ugh. The boy claimed that he had seen Gene, as he called him, leave the room mere minutes before he found his mother's body, which was backed up by one of Castor's neighbors. So he actually saw his poor mother. Yeah, he, he was the one that found her body first. I mean, he called the dad. Yep, probably called his dad and said, this guy just shot mom. Right. And then the dad called the police. I mean. I can't imagine. Why didn't the neighbor call? Well, the neighbor. Or helped just, the little boy. The neighbor just heard, he heard two or three gunshots uh-huh. and then heard the son crying. Oh. So, yeah. Ugh. Can't imagine. Just cannot imagine. Right. In the meantime, Barrett announced through his attorney that he wished to remain incarcerated until he could deal with his quote unquote problem. Oh, okay. So you he wants to stay behind bars, but he didn't do it. But he didn't do it. And he you know, just happens to have a problem. Murderizing people. Correct. Correct. <laughs> 
Because there's murder logic behind that shit. Yeah. All right, murderizing. Murderizing. Yes. This claim was partially granted when the judge revoked his bail, leading him to being imprisoned until his trial. Oh, finally, somebody who understands this shit. Somebody pulled their head out of their ass for more than three seconds. Surprise. <laughs> right. At the trial, Barrett's attorney reiterated that his client's actions were the result of Castner's perceived mistreatment of him, which eventually led to him snapping and killing her in a fit of rage. Can he prove that she even had contact with him? I don't believe so. And even if she did, and she why moved. does that justify? Right. No, I mean, that's just it. Yeah. He, this guy's obviously <laughs> delusional. Extremely. What is he basing the delusions on? She moved, right? She yeah. moved from a different apartment. Yep. Well, across the street. I would have moved hella far away, but that's just me. Right. And, but my point is, is that he's not even basing this on an accidental hello it sounds like Mm -hmm. like they both came home she had groceries he was coming back from the bar yeah and she's like hey you know hey Uh, my bad for existing i guess shit so i mean fucking yeah right did was he ever evaluated for any mental health issues nothing that i could find really nothing that i could find despite these things despite all this bullshit Despite the fact he checked himself into the hospital, mm-hmm. the state of Hawaii doesn't even evaluate him? Because why would they? That would, that would just make too much sense. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Barrett himself claimed that this was the cause, as he said that he wanted to kill the bitch for constantly choosing all the other guys over him. Oh my God. So this is a, a jealous rage. Yeah, well... I'm, from the way he seems to act and the way he seems to drink, I'm pretty sure I would pick a half brain dead yak over this guy. Right. A murderer. I would pick anybody <laughs> over a murderer. I mean, well. <laughs> what? There's no well. <laughs> the one that's obsessed with serial killers, I can say well. <laughs> I mean, I would never date somebody like that, I Mina. Mean, uh, uh-huh. I'm starting to worry a little bit now. <laughs> Too bad you're in a room alone with me. (laughs) Charlie will protect me. (laughs) (laughs) So for this, for some god-awful reason, did not success in swaying the jury, who found him guilty on all counts, resulting in a life sentence. Oh shit, I thought for a second there you were going to say you found (laughs) him innocent, and I was just going to fall out of my chair, (laughs) because I just... (laughs) The fact that the little boy had to find his mother alone. Ugh. I would have said, fucker, you're going to fry. And that's what I would have done. Does Hawaii have the death penalty? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Presiding Justice Wendell K. Hubby also imposed a requirement to serve at least 40 years before he could be eligible for parole. Very good. I Very wouldn't, good. I wouldn't say he's eligible at all, but that's Correct. just me. Correct. But 40 years, ha- he's what at this age? At this point. Let's see, he's he in was, his 30s? Yeah, he was born in 1931. 1931? Yeah. 95. 1995? So he's 60. 95, yes. Okay, so in 40 years, he'll be 100 years old. Some people live that long. I know, but in prison? Well, yeah, fair. If there's karma or justice in the world, his ass gets shanked. Correct. Sentence was commended by prosecutor Fred Titcomb who also stated that his original life sentence should have never been commuted and that if his daughter had been the one that was killed, he would have sued the state for damages. Correct. Mm -hmm. Somebody should be fucking suing somebody. Right, because somebody messed up. Governor. (laughs) After his sentencing, Barrett was transferred to an out-of-state facility in Oklahoma where he spent the majority of his prison sentence. He was occasionally contacted by his son's wife, who sent him photos of his grandsons, as his son resented him too much to do it himself. Wait a minute. When did this guy have kids? I could never find anything. All I could see was that one little blurb that the, I guess, daughter-in-law would send him pictures. <laughs> I'm going to assume it may have been with, like, the first lady because they dated for a while. So I don't know. And it never said who the youngest, the one that she was taking care of in the bedroom, never said who the dad was on that one. Okay. Okay, so the son has the su- da- his wife mm-hmm. send letters. Yep, because okay. the son resented him too much. I wouldn't have sent shit. I'd be like, fuck no. you. Yeah. 
You're a murderer. I don't sp- send my sperm donor anything, and he's not a murderer. He's just an asshole. She means her father, folks. That one. Yeah. The guy. The guy. The guy part. Yeah. Okay. 2003, Barrett was returned to Hawaii and sent to the Halawa Correctional Facility. However, he fell ill and was transferred to the Polly Mommy Medical Center, where he died from an undisclosed illness November 8th, 2003. Undisclosed? Are we talking AIDS? Well, who knows? Or maybe he was just shanked while he was in prison, and they're like, oh, no, he was ill. Right. And uh, Jack Ruby died from a very expedited form of cancer, which is very convenient. But whatever. Convenience. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Anywho, okay, well, that one obviously was a reference to President Kennedy. (laughs) But still, the the, the conspiracy or the, the... the secrecy behind mm-hmm. some of these things are very interesting. Oh yeah, I like I like to think that he was served karma. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, once you know someone found out that maybe, why did they send him to Oklahoma if it was a state? Was it a federal charge or state? Mm. Because to me, that doesn't make sense that they would send him out of state if it wasn't federal charges. Does that one, that... I'm not sure. You know, maybe maybe she. One of one of the three women may have had like family members in prison or something, so they might have done it for like safety, safety reasons. reasons. Okay, or a prison guard. One of her, yeah, one of the victims was like related to or a, something. A, pr- a prison guard. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Well, that that makes sense. Yeah. So, have you been to Hawaii? I have not. My mom has been like three times and has never taken me. Oh well, you know your mom. Mm. Well, and to be fair. My chunky butt, I don't think I'd like it. I get hot <laughs> real easy. So we actually did go. Mm-hmm. Obviously not for the podcast. Oh, yeah. But Michael, the panda, and my youngest son went. Mm-hmm. And I really think my most memorable moment with them was we were doing a cage dive with mm-hmm. sharks. Ooh. And I have these two pictures the mm-hmm. first picture is both of him on the boat like waiting to go out to sea mm-hmm. and they're both sitting there looking at their phones of course the second picture is of the boys obviously in their swimsuits just smiling and laughing and talking mm-hmm. and phones are nowhere in sight and we're actually coming back yeah from the cage dive and it's just a really nice moment mm-hmm. Because I think that was really kind of monumentous to both. Yeah. My youngest son had said that that was really awesome Mm -hmm. to see the sharks. Oh, yeah. I would imagine. And it's funny because right before we went, you know how you come across videos and stuff on Facebook? Oh, yeah. There was this one of this scuba diver, Mm -hmm. cageless, and he's like, Got like a GoPro or something on and turns around and there's this great white shark. And I have to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Surprise. I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I may have panicked if I saw a great white. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. Despite the cage. (laughs) I saw Jaws. I see Jaws a lot. I, I actually enjoy Jaws. Yeah. As a movie. So, uh Yes. That's what I would say. (laughs) If you ever go to Hawaii, that is something I would truly recommend. It was an awesome experience. And to me, you know, I had this before and after picture. Yeah. That just, I just kind of smile every time I think about it. Yeah, for sure. And some of the food was actually really good. And I mean, I am not very good at trying new things, despite the fact that I literally go. Yeah. To these foreign places. <laughs> but I always get a little nervous about trying something new. Mm-hmm. However, when it came to the real authentic Hawaiian food, yeah, I really had a hard time with that. Hey, so Panda do. ate my food for me. Yeah. I'm the same way. Like, I'm a big, I'm weird with food. Like, I'm a big texture person. Right. Like, there's certain things. Like, I can't eat watermelon. Okay. I like the taste of watermelon. The texture freaks me out. Because it crumbles kind of easily? Well, and like, and sometimes it's like gritty and it's like mush and I, okay, all right. (laughs) 
So either way, if yeah. ever you get a chance yes. and our listeners ever get a chance, I would definitely recommend going to Hawaii. For sure. It was a really wonderful and memorable experience for me and my, my son. Yeah. So. All right. So that is what we have for you tonight. That is it. On to business. So Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Where the dark corners are has a Facebook page. So if you like to see creepy things, share creepy things, go ahead and send us a request on over to that Facebook page. And, you know, we're actually getting some people who are starting to share things. Mm -hmm. And we're doing some fun surveys. I yes. hear our <laughs> latest survey. So one of the things, because it's Christmas, we we did a episode of our favorite top three mm -hmm. Christmas movies. And the controversial Die Hard movie <laughs> came up a couple of times. So we did a survey. Yeah. The survey says... Die Hard is absolutely a Christmas movie. It was voted a Christmas movie, <laughs> which Sierra was advocating for. Yeah. So, yay, it takes Sierra. place. It takes place during Christmas. Right. Counts. Right, right, right. And gave us new terms like yippee ki -yay. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. So, yes, we're doing fun things, surveys, mm -hmm. and it's definitely a way to engage with us. Yeah. And... If you have a request or if you would like Sierra to touch in on a serial killer, especially the lesser known ones, yes. give us, send us an email or send us a request via Facebook mm -hmm. and let us know. But email wise, send it to where the dark corners are at gmail.com. Final thought, Sierra. System failed terribly. Absolutely. And the sad part is he's not the only one. Oh, no. No, no. That they've let slip through the cracks. Oh, yeah. Trust so. me, I have a notebook full of serial killers that I've been doing some research on, and there's some of them. <laughs> that oh. really, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll be hearing those soon, I'm sure. Yes. All right. So until next time, please remember, only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is why we hope to meet you where the dark corners are. <laughs>